we hope you enjoyed the conference yesterday and thank you so much everyone uh, for joining us today's uh, keynote. We have an exciting lineup today as well, beginning with our first speaker, Corey Holen, CTO and co-founder of Mattermost Inc. Mattermost is the uh, creator of open source enterprise messaging workplace built for uh, privacy conscious, con conscious organizations. Prior to Mattermost, Corey founded Tipco AI, a machine intelligence startup spun out from Stanford Research Institute, which was acquired by Salesforce.com. Today, Corey joined us to discuss working effectively in remote environments. Please welcome Corey Holen. Hello, my name is Corey Hewlin. Um, I'm co-founder and CTO of Mattermost, and I'm going to be giving a talk about uh, working effectively in remote environments. Uh, so a little history or story uh, real quick. Mattermost is a fully remote company. We've been fully remote since our inception. Um, so we've been operating um, in this sort of environment for the last uh, five or six years. So let's, before we can really talk about effective work, uh, maybe we should talk about some of the sort of benefits and drawbacks. Uh, so what are the benefits of fully remote, remote development? Some of the benefits that we find are, you, know, you have that sort of quality deep work time, that, that quality time where you're just, you know, you have a lot of focus time where you can work, you can do what you set to achieve, you don't have a whole lot of external interruptions. Um, and we find that's probably one of its biggest advantages. Um, the, other, the other advantage is sort of that asynchronous nature, right? You have uh, less interruptions, you have less people coming by your office um, or your cubicle or less distractions out there as well. So just the ability to really focus and that asynchronous ability, which causes you know, a lot less interruptions. Um, we as a company also find this to be advantage because there's you know, a vast sea of resources out there. Uh, in terms of people who want to work for uh, remote style companies. Now, I know in the age of COVID, and we'll kind of talk about the differences that we see. Um, I mean, you know, that may change for the future, and I, I think that would be awesome if it does happen. Um, you know, I think remote work is definitely a, a benefit for all. Um, you know, the other big benefit is it saves things like, you know, commute time or drive time. Um, so you have either more hours to spend with your family or do other stuff or whatever it is, more focused time. Um, so we, we find that as a company, you know, having that ability to, to have access to a lot of that, that, that vast sea of resources is really important. Um, and then what it ends up attracting is people who are sort of very mission driven, right? Um, most sort of fundamentally believe in the work that they're doing. Um, I always kind of break it down into to be successful in a room environment. We'll kind of get into these two things, but you have to be, there's kind of two things. One is you have to be really good at asynchronous written form communication. We'll talk about that, so that's one. Uh, and then two is you have to be internally motivated, right? Um, there's no external peer pressure. There's no, there's no peers sitting next to you. Uh, there's no external boss hovering over you, right? Uh, so what we, what we find is, you know, we fundamentally find people that sort of believe in this work, believe in the nature of what we're doing. Um, the other interesting benefit, um, you know, pre-COVID at least, was you could be a digital nomad. Um, I was kind of the poster child for that for a number of years. Um, so I spent two summers in Alaska and two winters in Florida and kind of everywhere else in between. So as long as you have a good internet connection, um, you know, it's, you, could, you could work from anywhere, being a, being in, in a, a knowledge worker in a remote environment. Um, so I know those may not be familiar with, you know, American geography or whatever, but, you know, Alaskan... Florida about as far apart as you can get and, and still drive a car in between them. Um, um, you know, so it's, I don't know what it is, probably three, 4,000 miles apart, um, several thousand kilometers. Um, so, um, and I kind of spent everywhere in between. And so, you know, it's being remote is one of those uh, lifestyles that you could have. Um, um, and it gives you a lot of, I think, at least sort of mental health, right? Uh, you know, if you're often doing a bunch of different fun stuff. Um, you know, that, those are actually pictures of me kind of sort of all, all over. Um, 
Uh, we have a what we call matter mug. Um, so it's a mug that we give to our community members, our people who participate in Mattermost Open Source Project. And I just like to take pictures with it in strange locations. Um, so what are some of the drawbacks of being fully remote? I mean, there definitely are drawbacks. Um, um, I'd say the, the probably one of the biggest ones is what I like to call virtual doors, knocking on virtual doors. Um, it's really hard to do. Like if you think of yourself being in an office, um, in a physical office, and somebody has a shut door, it's really hard in that physical office to go knock on that door, interrupt somebody, and say, hey, I want to spend some time, let's talk about X, Y, and Z. Uh, it's even harder when you talk about a virtual door, right? Um, and so that, that's one of those things that we try uh, really hard with certain tools and techniques to sort of um, get past, but it's definitely, it's definitely a drawback, right? Um, um, you know, the other one that's sort of one of those ones you don't really think about is, you know, who's in the office, right? It's really easy to see uh, when you show up to a physical office who's in and who's not. And you get a sense right away that, you know, when you, whether you go to lunch or whether you do stuff like, oh, you know, uh, Joe or Sally must be out on vacation because they're not here this week or whatever. So it's one of those things that you kind of miss when you go to a fully remote environment. It's just that really easy way to detect, you know, who's in and who's out. Um, and lastly, you know, one of the biggest drawbacks I would say is, you know, everything kind of turns into the, this need for a scheduled meeting um, when you're remote. Um, and that, that's something that we try really hard to defend against. But and we understand it's you know it's part of the process, it's part of being remote. Um, but you do have this sort of, you know, everything kind of turns into this um, scheduled meeting need or whatever. Uh, the other big drawback, uh, you know, especially in the this time of COVID, is just that sort of uh, missing, you know, human face-to-face -face time. Um, I'll, you know, we, we as a company, like I said, we were remote, we've been remote since our inception. Uh, you know, we as a company have always struggled with this, right? And I would say more so now post-COVID. And we can get into the reasons why. But we, at the very least, as a company, and here's some pictures from our previous, what we call MatterCons. Uh, we, at very least, as a company and a community, an open source community, we used to get together at least once a year at MatterCon. So we would actually fly in all of our staff members, fly in a bunch of our community members, um, and just just have a big meetup at least once a year. Uh, the feature teams would actually get together more than once a year. Some of the feature teams got together several times a year, and it's just a great way to sort of to build trust, to to sort of you know get rid of that human element, to to see people face to face. Like there is some you know you do have to recognize there is some need for that. And even for us, right? Um, you know during COVID we kind of shut down all of our meetups and stuff like that. So we, that's even been challenging for us, right? So we do a lot of other kind of activities. Um, and it's, it's not the same, it's, it's a good sort of supplement, um, but even we recognize that this is one of those things that we're, at least I'm hoping, you know, after COVID, um, that we can get back to doing, because there really is that need for that human face-to-face -face time. Um, so we kind of talked about benefits and drawbacks. Um, let's really quickly talk about what does effective communication look like, um, especially when you're remote. Um, you know, good communication uh, you need to be an organization that values asynchronous communication um, or an open source community. We're actually both. We're a, we're a company and we're also an open source community. You, so you need to be really good at that sort of asynchronous written form of communication uh, about writing everything down. Um, and so we strive really hard as an as open source community and as a company to really be open and to be open to writing everything down, especially for us because we deal with people all over the world in all time zones uh, because of our open source nature. And so the only way that you can always get um, sort of, you know, conceptually everybody in the same room is by taking a copious amount of notes um, and writing those notes down in some sort of, you know, persistent chat system. Um, we're also really good at ephemeral video. Um, um, it's one of those things that we recognize, you know, video is a great form of communication. We'll kind of go into that in a little bit. But, you know, being really good at sort of dropping into ephemeral video, um, uh, taking notes and dropping back out. You need to write everything down. I kind of already talked about that. You need to be anti-meeting. Um, this is hard. Like, we struggle with this as a, as a community and a company. Um, but we're very conscious about when we're adding meetings. We try really hard to go through and remove meetings. I mean, you're definitely going to have meetings. It's, it's a, you know, that's just a, the name of the game. But you have to remember that in, in a remote world, um, um, you know, everything kind of needs to be scheduled, right? Everything needs to have a meeting start time, end time, and there, there's not this serendipitous sort of meeting together. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, you just need to be 
sort of aware and try to limit those types of try to be very understanding and limiting in terms of what meetings you're adding. Um, uh, the last is simulated water cooler time. So this is probably one of the questions that comes up the most. We're like, ah, Corey, like, how do you guys do brainstorming? And we do do brainstorming. We have very much sort of that ad hoc hangout together time. And the difference is, is it's just the scheduling of it is just forced. Like the the event itself is very serendipitous. We talk about a lot of different stuff. Uh, we do it a lot of different ways here at Mattermost. Um, most of these ways, we always invite the community. So we, we sit together with the community and the company together, and we do these different things. Um, they range, they go all the way from things like tech moonshots, where we kind of just sit around and discuss uh, what we think we'd like to do, you know, architecturally and then for, and for the future, uh, all the way down to things like dev hangouts. Um, so we have a, a weekly uh, audio only chat where people can um, go into the hangout. They can just hang out, um, chat, talk about tech, program while you're sitting there listening. Other people talk about tech. It's just a great way to build connections. So I would say like we still have those serendipitous water cooler meetings, but but they're very scheduled or structured. Right. And, and, and the other example is, you know, people talk about, well, what about brainstorming in the office? And I'm, I'm like, yeah, we do the exact same thing. We schedule brainstorming sessions and we just have, I'd say the big difference is ours is probably more effective. Um, um, it's a little weird to get set up and it's a little weird to get used to, but I would say ours are a lot more effective because we're really, once we remember, because of our environment, we're really good at being asynchronous communicators and really good at taking notes. So the classic example is if you're in a, you know, if you're in the building and you're having a brainstorming session, you go into an office, everyone whites on a whiteboard, and that whiteboard is a free flow of ideas. It's some stuff over here, it's some stuff over there, it's some stuff over there. And usually the outcome of that, at least in my previous life, is you go there with your, fa your camera on your phone, you take a picture of it, and you send it to everybody, you know, over email or whatever. And that's how you document the event. And when you think back, when you think about it, that's a really poor way to do it. Um, so what we're really good about is creating something like a, a document that goes along with that session where we're kind of keeping track and somebody's you know taking copious notes and so you end up at the end of that session with a really amazing sort of brainstorm, brainstorming document. Um, so uh, next let's talk about you know what tools um, should I use for effective communication in a remote environment. Um, and we'll kind of go through some of these different tools. Um, I think first and foremost, the most overlooked one is just the home office setup. Um, you know, you need to be, I, I, and I especially I think, you know, because of things like COVID, people, you know, you just sort of went to the office one day and the next day you started working from home. And, and that can be really hard um, if you don't have the right setup, right? And whatever that setup is for you. Like, so if you're a company with staff members, you know, we really encourage you to make sure your staff are set up correctly. They have the, whatever it is that they need, the right video, uh, the right camcorder, or sorry, webcam, the right, um, you know, headset, uh, office chair, desk, whatever it is. Like, invest a little bit in that and getting that set up for your staff members. Of course, you know, I'm biased. So um, the next is having a channel-based collaboration, sort of persistent chat. Uh, I think that's probably one of the biggest ones in terms of this remote sort of collaboration and being effective. Um, once again, I'm super biased, like, you know, um, found and matter most on this premise of like, I think channel-based or topic-based communication is is really important. Uh, that's what Mattermost does. So if you're not familiar with Mattermost, it's a, you know, it's an open source alternative to Slack. It's probably the best way to describe it. Um, and at Mattermost, we use Mattermost. We use it, you know, hourly, daily. Um, we run our entire company and we run our entire community. So we have a community server that has 9,000 plus community members on it. I think we're getting close to 10,000 now. Um, several hundred staff members sit there and that is how we run our open source project and that is how we run our community. Um, and it, it kind of boils down to like one very simple thing, like channel-based or topic-based chat. So that's kind of important. It needs to be persisted, needs to be have history, it needs to be channel-based or topic-based. Uh, I truly believe, you know, when, when you think about things like channel-based, I truly believe something like email is the best for external communication, communicating outside of your company. But chat or channel base is the best for internal communication. And it's for a, a few very simple key reasons, but email is inherently private in the sense that that information is siloed in my inbox, in my email. So that, that's kind of one big strike against it. It's just that private nature of email. When you're talking about wanting to be collaborative within, let's say, a company or, or a community. Um, 
and and channel based or topic based chat is very open right if you have access to the channel you have access to all of that shared knowledge and anybody can be added you know to a channel in the middle of it and get access to all that shared knowledge so that ability to search through that history um, is really amazing and you have that async nature right that ability to go asynchronous chat is really interesting because it's one of the full few tools you can actually do both and we do do both uh, when we're talking about channels or things publicly or interacting with community members that we know sit in very different time zones we have a very asynchronous mindset right we're gonna send somebody a message and we know they're not gonna get it till tomorrow and we're not expecting a response one of the cool things about persistent chat though is you can drop into this synchronous mode right where you're having a let's say a direct message conversation with somebody and you're just literally chatting back and forth in real time um, so it, it really gives you that one that advantage as well uh, and lastly what i'd like to say is sort of you know we call it integrations and bots for central command however you want to describe it um, but it's the ability to take um, structured data so this is data coming from things like integrations and analytic tools and you know, let's say logging tools, whatever it is, and that's piping structured information into a channel and then having unstructured information or information coming from humans augmenting that information in a channel. So the best is talk about an example, right? When you talk, let's say incident response, you're having an outage at your company or your whatever service is going down. There's no better way to, to act, especially as or even as a non-remote company, but especially as a remote company, where you're kind of getting everything in the right sort of topic at the right time. So you're getting automated stuff pumping messages into that room where you where humans are sort of doing the analysis and investigating what's going on with the outage and having people respond there in real time and being able to hand off that event, like, hey, I'm you know, it's my nighttime, I'm ready to, to sign out at someone else's you know, on-call schedule is going to come over and take take over this event, and they can automatically join the channel and see all of that stream of confidence, that shared history, that shared command. Like that is a super powerful concept when you're talking about sort of channel-based collaboration. So you know, for for like I said, I'm biased. You know, coming from Mattermost, but we believe you know channel-based or topic-based communication is one of the keys uh, to running a sort of fully remote remote team. Now, the second most important pillar uh, in sort of remote collaboration is ephemeral video. Um, I think it's one of those things you have to really be good at. I mean, I know people you know, in the time of COVID, people have already gone to it and they're holding meetings there and stuff like that. But I think there's a few key differences. Of course, when you're having meetings, you're having ephemeral video. When you're having one-on-ones, you're doing it through video. So video has a lot of implications, especially ephemeral video, that make communication really easy. And we have a lot of ephemeral video. The key, once again, is being very good at taking copious notes and taking those notes and posting them back into a channel, especially when you're having a sort of brainstorming session or whatever it is. Um, so let me describe a scenario to you where we're really good as a community and company in the sense of, you know, you, you, you can see those conversations in Mattermost evolving, right? They, there's, some, there's some conversation that's, you know, 50 replies deep on this thread. And you can tell people are communicating on that thread and they're just sort of they're not, they're kind of talking past each other. They're not, they, people aren't understanding each other's point of view, right? And you'll see, you'll see in our, in our community, it's really interesting. You'll see someone like, hey, let's just hop on a call. And like, all right. And so they'll, they'll go over to, to a Jitsi video or something like that. And they'll sit in that Jitsi video for, they'll, they'll bring up that ephemeral video and they'll, they'll, they'll talk. And the reason they do that is because, you know, picture, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? It's a lot more efficient to communicate. It's a lot more efficient to understand people's opinions or sides of the argument. And there's the little nuances that you get in video, right? Which is really important. It's key to sort of that human interaction, which is you can, it's easier to tell when somebody, you know, the written form of the word versus the spoken form of the world, it's word, it can be really hard to tell when somebody's joking, um, you know, or, or someone, you know, said that in jest or, or um, you know, so it can be really hard to pick those things up sometimes, but it's really easy uh, when you talk about it, in, or a lot easier at least, when you talk about it in terms of seeing somebody's expression and how they're responding and seeing either like, oh, that person's totally relaxed and joking. I thought they were upset. Um, and that, that, you know, that's one of those things that comes across a lot easier in video. So you'll see lots of times the conversation in, in chat will devolve. Um, they'll, the group will immediately join a video, they'll hash it out. And the key here is while they're hashing it out, they're taking copious notes and they'll post that information back into the channel. Here's the outcome, right? Because one of the things that you realize, especially as an open source community, but, but as a company that goes fully remote now, it's a lot harder in the sense that, you know, there's always going to be somebody out. There's always going to be somebody, whatever it is, that, you know, sick or on vacation, 
um, or in our case, you know, an open source community member who might be asleep in the middle of the night, right? And you want to share with them the details of the outcome of that conversation. There's nothing more frustrating than, than seeing a conversation, seeing it got moved into some video chat, and then there's no summary of it posted back in the channel. Like, well, wait a minute, there was something important discussed there. What was the outcome, right? And you, you want that asynchronous nature. And then that's really kind of key to this, this ephemeral video piece. Um, it's sort of being able to drop into those, those conversations take copious notes, um, and then post it back in the channel. Um, uh, next, we'll talk about um, shared documents. So I think this is sort of the, the last and third major pillar, I would say. Um, you really need a, a, a ability to share documents. Um, um, so whether this be something like, you know, a, a, an open source one like Collabora Online, or something like Google Docs, um, you really need a, you really need um, a, uh, a document system that kind of captures that structure. And you'll see us do this all the time in Mattermost. So we're really good at using persistent chat for things like async, even things like sync conversations are really good for using ephemeral video for, for discussing stuff. And we're really good at using sort of documents, shared documents for things like capturing structure and long lived documents. And they're kind of, it's very subtle in terms of when you think about when you use each of these tools, but it's very meaningful and impactful in terms of how you do it, right? And you really want that long-lived document. You really want that document that gives you some really good structure that you can go back to, you can share outside of, let's say, your channel or video that you're working on. Um, and so just just having, and like I said, this one's, you know, it's one of those ones kind of obvious, like, wow, Corey, everyone uses, you know, some sort of shared document. Yeah, they do, but I, they don't they don't necessarily create a shared document for everything, right? So, and I'm not suggesting that, but I'm suggesting, like, create more shared documents than you think, right? So the best, best example is we create shared documents for even meetings. So we have a shared document where we run our weekly recurring R&D meeting, and we just go in there and put the agenda in there. People can go and put comments. People can come in and, and, and say like, hey, I want to demo this week. And then we have like a running history in that shared document um, of what happened in a very structured way, right? And so that, that's just kind of one small way. And so, you know, most people use documents for things like, you know, producing, let's say, specs or design docs. Like, yes, definitely use shared documents in that, and we do too. Um, and those are still great, linking those in the channels and stuff like that. But we also use a lot of shared docs for, like I said, things like meetings, specific meetings. Um, we also use a lot of shared docs for things like one-on-one, -on -one, right? One-on-ones with your manager, right? So you can go in and you have this running shared doc of one-on-one -on -one stuff um, that you can both add to. And, and like I said, it, it's it's maybe it's an obvious thing, but it's one of those things that's not so obvious in terms of you know using that kind of tool more because that structured document, that long-lived document, um, gives you something different from you know persistent chat. It gives you something different from ephemeral video. Yeah, so how can you reach? Thank you. Um, how can you reach me? Um, the best way to reach me is probably on our community server, community.mattermost.com. You can just add message me at Corey. Uh, you can always use email, uh, Corey at Hewlin, or my personal email, um, sorry, my work email, Corey at Mattermost, or my personal email, Corey at Hewlin.com, uh, or on Twitter. So those are the best ways to reach me. But I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear what are some of the things that you struggle with? What are some of the things that you, because like I said, we don't have, I know, you know, we don't have all the answers to all this. Like we constantly trying to improve. We've been doing this for five, six years now and we're constantly trying to improve. Um, so if you could share with me your thoughts and processes and, and experiences, like I would, that would be awesome. So please feel free. And thank you very much. Thank you, Corey. Our next keynote speaker, is Adam Kibit. Adam works on connected vehicle and project engineering at Canoo, a company that is innovating on the idea of what it means to have an electric vehicle in the city. Today, Adam will discuss the uh, symbiotic innovation of using open source at startups. Please welcome Adam Kibit. Good morning, good evening. Uh, since this is a virtual conference, I'm not quite sure what time it is for everybody, uh, but welcome. Uh, today I'll be going through uh, Symbiotic Innovation, open source for startups. Just to kind of set the tone for the, the discussion, uh, give a quote from Guy Kawasaki, ideas are easy, implementation is hard. I think this quote really captures, uh, captures the problem statement and some of the troubles that, 
that uh, stretch tend to uh, tend to go through. In terms of the agenda, uh, I'll give a quick introduction of myself and, and Canoe. Uh, we'll talk about what makes a startup hard. What are the, some of the problems that, that a startup has to go through on a daily basis? Uh, we'll dive into those problems and, and discuss what open, soft, open source software uh, helps, uh, provides in, to, to help solve those problems. And we'll talk about what startups do to provide uh, to provide back to the open source uh, projects or open source software uh, to, to create that cycle of uh, symbiotic innovation. Um, and then we'll give some final thoughts uh, and uh, conclusions and, and what are the what are the next steps and where do we go from here? Uh, introductions. My name is is Adam Kibbit. I uh, worked in the automotive industry for about 15 years, working on electronics and software. Uh, I have extensive uh, extensive experience in infotainment, connected vehicles, cloud, cloud services. Uh, and I've worked on everything from 16-bit micros to complex cloud systems. I, I, I work at Canoe. Uh, Canoe uh, at Canoe, I am in charge of the uh, connected vehicle and digital product engineering groups. Uh, and uh, Canoe is an EV, uh, EV company that launched in 2018. Uh, we reached beta in 19 months, uh, and we've along the way we've developed this highly modular skateboard uh, platform uh, containing all the components of an electronic powertrain. And, and the, the areas where, where I, uh, I uh, work uh, in the connected vehicle area, uh, we have used uh, we have used open source projects and uh, automotive grade Linux. Uh, to create to create our unique uh, user experience. So, what makes a startup hard? Well, the first the first problem or the first challenge to talk about is crazy timelines. Uh, it speed to market is 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 often a big thing for for startups trying to hit uh, trying to hit a window of viability for a product or trying to trying to get things out uh, before a, a competitor um, gets their gets their product on the market is 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 usually very critical for for a startup. Um, in addition, going through product iterations and proof of concepts uh, and really kind of going through this to to resolve the product goals uh, to understand precisely uh, to refine that product into something that that is is saleable and and, and useful. Um, uh, proof of concepts help to, to kind of settle these, uh, you know, settle, settle these differences and provide uh, provide feedback to this process. Um, they also are, are very useful for providing demonstrations to potential investors or customers. Uh, the next the next challenge is financial management. Uh, it, every startup has to be has to be cost conscious. Uh, they, they don't always have an income source. So they, they're they're kind of on a uh, a, a limited uh, limited budget, um, and so, so understanding precisely uh, what what you're getting before committing to it. So you uh, you tend to try try a lot of things before committing resources or committing uh, funds to something, um, and and understanding you know when to spend the money. Uh, so when when exactly do you need to spend the money? Not always do you need to spend everything at the beginning of the program, uh, it, uh, but obviously after you know too late in the program can be a problem. So understanding exactly know uh, exactly when to spend the money is important, um, and then knowing the full cost of commercialization. How much will it take for you to to create uh, to take the the proof of concept or the the, the product that you have currently um, and and put that into production? And so those are those are some of the uh, the challenges. In addition, uh, uh, startups tend to run skeleton crews. They tend to have very, very small teams, um, and and the teams are kept small for a reason. Uh, there, they, it's a lot easier to keep a small team aligned and focused on a singular goal. Uh, it, as teams grow, it, it, communication uh, and processes become necessary, and and they start stifling, uh, start stifling innovation, and start stifling. Uh, the the uh, productivity of, of of some of its higher performing members, um, and so you know so to 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 kind of control this, you have to understand when when you need team uh, uh, people to be added to the program. You need to find flexible team members, uh, and and really understand the the needs, uh, the the skill sets that you're looking for at that given time. And so 
how does how does open source software help to solve these? Well, for crazy timelines, open source software uh, provides a starting point. It provides uh, foundational components and other building blocks that uh, that are useful for for getting off the ground. Uh, sometimes, get just getting started is the hardest part of of a project, especially when you're given a, a blank sheet of paper, which is which is precisely the situation you know you had we had here at Canoe. Um, and, and so just getting, getting that, uh, that little kick in, uh, kick in the rear, uh, to get going is, is a, uh, an important, uh, important aspect of, of open source software and, and, uh, open source projects like automotive grade Linux provide a great, uh, great, uh, foundation, set of foundational components, uh, to enable this, uh, uh, uh this type of building. Um, to kind of build on that, open source projects often provide reference designs and implementation. So, so you can take and, and create a, a sample application uh, fairly quickly uh, with, uh, with uh, many open source projects. And so this, this helps to, uh, to, to uh, uh, spur, uh, spur the, the designs and, and also helps to, to quickly build up proof of concepts. And uh, as mentioned previously, proof of concepts uh, are uh, key uh, to, to to the design iterations and providing providing uh, direct feedback to the to the uh, the product definition process, um, and and uh, like automotive grid Linux is another. Uh, it also uh, provides a, a lot of resources here too, um, to to allow you to quickly build and install software, uh, and and get things up and running and and provide uh, demonstration and and reference uh, reference. Uh, does, uh, reference platforms that can allow you to cre create those uh, really neat proof of concepts that, that are useful going forward. Um, and all of this, you kind of combine all of this and it really provides a shorter path to a demonstrable product. Uh, it, it allows, it, it creates things that people can interact with um, and, and it, creating, creating real software and, and providing real interactions uh, is it is always preferable over PowerPoint. PowerPoints um, are great and they, they definitely serve a purpose. Uh, but if you have if you have something to show a demonstration or, or real product interactions uh, are always always a, a preferred preferred method. Um, and, and it really it really gives you the opportunity to test out your theories um, to understand what's good and bad about your uh, about the, the product that you're developing. And so uh, to kind of continue on this, uh, if we look at financial management, so what uh, what does is, what is, uh, open source software provide from, from a financial management perspective? Well, it, it, the initial investment is, is fairly low. Uh, the, uh, it's, you know, when, you know, the difference, you know, going, going for commercial software versus open source software, um, when, when you're going in front of a budget meeting or sourcing council um, to, to uh, get, get resources to, to pay for project fees or license fees, or uh, you need this fee to get started fees, um, it's often difficult to explain to people that I just need this right now um, just to get going. It doesn't really give us any any working software, it just gives us the ability to develop on this. Um, that that always often uh, creates uh, creates some interesting conversations. And so, if you have the option to go with an open source project um, where the 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 software is at uh, you know at at no cost or or you know um, and provides you provides you similar uh, the similar ability to get started, um, this is oft, often much more preferred. Um, and then maintenance. Maintenance is one of those things that often gets uh, put on the, uh, the the column of uh, it's it's a it's a negative. Um, but I I see uh, maintenance as a as a positive. Um, maintenance uh, it can be can be kind of scary uh, because you don't you're you're picking up an open source project where there's no support there 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 may not may not be a support system um, in place. Um, and and so uh, you're you're taking on a lot of responsibility and a lot of risk and a lot of, uh, and and so it can be quite intimidating at the, at the onset. Um, but the control that open source projects give you uh, allows the startup to really become a master of their own destiny um, by working with and understanding the open source project rather than fighting it. Uh, the the skills within your organization will grow. 
Um, these skills will, will then become an asset of the organization and allow you to insource and reduce outside dependencies, um, making forecasting of, of like future support and, and maintenance costs uh, more straightforward because they're not dependent on, on what a, another company uh, will provide. Um, it's, all, it's all based on what your, what your capabilities are on, uh, on within the company. Um, and then the last, the last aspect of, of financial management is obviously uh, it is is cost. Uh, the license and royalties that you you pay often uh, get attached to the, the product, final product cost. Um, and while these vendors deserve to, to to ask for products that they've put in put in hard work to create, um, and not having these, uh, especially for a startup, allows you uh, provides you significant flexibility uh, to provide your products, your end products at a, uh, at lower cost to your customers. Um, and it is really, it can be, a, it can be seen as a way of giving back and putting all of this together. It really, you know, kind of ties the ties, ties a nice bow around, uh, you know, the path to commercialization. You, you have, uh, you understand what it's going to take to maintain, you understand what the costs are going in, um, and you understand what the initial investment is. Um, and so this makes it much easier to, to realize uh, to realize a, a production or commercialization path. And so the last one for, for team size, uh, uh, open source provides a community. Uh, there's always a worry that you'll uh, worry that with open source you'll be you'll be on your own. Um, but I've kind of found the opposite. Uh, forums, mailing lists, uh, IRC IRC channels. Uh, all of these provide an avenue, a support channel uh, to 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 get to to ask questions and get some feedback. Um, and so, while it, you know, while some some people think you know it's it's it, you you're going to have to solve all these problems on your own, you you won't have any support. Uh, I you know I've never felt like I was alone. Um, there always seems to be a uh, a like-minded person out there who's trying to solve a similar problem. Um, who's more than happy to have uh, to provide a helping hand, or even just uh, to just kind of talk through uh, potential solutions. Um, and then technical documentation. Technical technical documentation is always was always seemed always seemed to be a, a selling point of commercial software. Uh, but now uh, the communities behind open source have made it uh, so commonplace to see good, if not great, documentation associated with each. E each project, um, it, it has really uh, reduced the intimidation factor that comes with taking taking on software that you don't know, um, and it makes makes the integration uh, of these projects so much easier. Um, the fact that you can see how the software works, you can understand, you can understand uh, how it, like how it's intended to be used, and you can and you can read what are the what's the uh, the error cases and 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 uh, fail safe uh, scenarios, uh, it makes makes the, the maturity of the application that goes on top uh, significantly better. Um, and then the last the last aspect of this is is a larger community really means there's more people out there in in the case where you actually do want to hire people. Um, no longer do you have to uh, to find people with a uh, like an archaic or a very uh, specific skill set, uh, a, a skill set or, or technology set. Um, you uh, or, or hope that they'll be able to come in and pick up your proprietary architecture. Um, you can rely on some open, uh, open and standardized skills, um, and it generally makes makes finding people uh, that can help your help your company out uh, uh, significantly easier. And as I mentioned, like finding finding uh, the right skill set at the right time is important for a startup. And so, what do startups provide in return? Uh, I talked about all the things that that startups get out of this relationship. What do startups provide in return? And startups can do things that uh, that larger companies maybe can't, uh, and so they they can push boundaries. Uh, they can push technology boundaries, user user experience boundaries, product boundaries, and and so what do I mean there? The technology boundaries. If you look at all of the uh, AI and autonomous startups that are trying to push the the, the boundaries of what's possible on autonomous. Uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, uh, companies, a lot of these startups are using open source projects, and so by using the open source project, the, the open source projects uh, get uh, more 
get get associated with the, with the successes of that of that startup, and and more people are are encouraged to use those uh, those open source projects because of it. Uh, startups can also push the, the user experience boundaries by uh, by putting a different spin on the same problem. Startups can uh, can can change change the conversation around uh, around user experience. This is an area where I think Canoe uh, has has uh, has can have some impact. Uh, as we're, you know, we're taking a different spin on on uh, our user experience, and and by using op, uh, automotive grade Linux to power our experience, uh, it it shows it it provides an alternative uh, example or alternative use case to an already uh, impressive uh, open source project. Um, and then finally, uh, it, startups can push can push uh, product boundaries. Uh, Tesla is a great example of this. They've pushed. Push boundaries on what on on what the the product can do uh, from from uh, from EVs and traditional automotive, uh, and 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 their uh, Tesla's reliance on uh, Linux and, and open source technologies uh, kind of furthers that conversation and shows that it's really possible. And then uh, uh, the startups can also contribute to the community. And this may be a little bit the the, the benefits here. Uh, you know, are a little bit more obvious. Uh, you know, with the startups being able to to uh, find bugs and, and uh, commit patches, uh, commit fix, fixes and patches. Uh, it, you know, as, as as more people use it, it it's obvious that more people, uh, more more developers will be able to have a look at it and and kind of create new features um, and even create new projects. Uh, you know, the canoe has plans to 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 contribute back to the open source community as well. Um, uh, you know, as our as a as our company grows, um, and then the last the last thing that startups can provide in return is, is startups can be open source advocates. Um, and a great example of this is what I'm doing right now, uh, presenting at an open source conference, uh, it, being vocal supporters of open source and and the uh, the projects uh, that are around it, and provide provide great examples of what's what is really possible with open source. And so, some final thoughts. Uh, so, I, I, you know, kind of when I look at this, I look at I look at how startups and open source really are made for each other. They really need each other. Um, they uh, uh, startups startups definitely um, get uh, get some benefits out of this. They get a head start uh, by using open source technology to to kind of jumpstart their product uh, product. Uh, uh, development and, and, and engineering efforts. Um, open source uh, open source software uh, uh, open source projects also get benefits out of this association from from kind of latching onto the successes of, of startups um, to to uh, being being a comp uh, accompanying the technology and innovation changes that 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 surround them. Um, and, and and when you really when you start putting these things together. Uh, you you can see how they it, it's this snowball effect this, uh, of a symbiotic innovation um, to where both both uh, startups and open source uh, projects um, can really can really uh, create amazing things together and and that 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 innovation that symbiotic innovation um, that's created from these from this relationship is is really something we all need. Uh, startups powered by open source can have the ability to create amazing products, uh, amazing services, um, and amazing tools that not only create uh, great user, uh, great experiences for for users, but also spur innovation. Um, they this by by changing the, the changing the conversation or, uh, on on new products and new ideas, um, whether they're successful or not. By by just uh, changing changing the thoughts of those around, um, it, it helps generate those new conversations, um, and 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 those conversations uh, really have an effect on on innovation, on uh, creating uh, creating real innovation around uh, you know uh, as as things that were deemed uh, maybe not possible or not likely uh, all of a sudden become uh, become a real possibility, and and open source has been essential to Canoe's success. And it, I, I see great things coming from the future. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Thanks, Adam. Our next speaker today is Shane Kaufman, the OpenGen General Manager here at the Linux Foundation. Shane's professional accom accom accomplishments include 
spearheading the uh, licensing team that elevated Open uh, Innovation Network, OIM, into the uh, uh, largest patent non-aggression community in the history. Establishing the uh, leading the professional network of open source legal experts and aligning stakeholders to launch both the uh, first law journal and the first law book dedicated to open source. Today, Shane will talk about open chain not only as an industry standard, but as the first IPO standard to come out from our uh, Joint Development Foundation. Please welcome Shane Copeland. I'm Shane Coughlin, and I'm the general manager of the Open Chain project. I'm delighted to be here with you today to talk about Open Chain not only as an industry standard, but as the first standard to come out of our joint development foundation. So, let's start at the beginning. Open Chain has been in market since October 2016. This industry standard has focused on open source license compliance in a short but effective specification, just seven pages long. We've identified the key requirements of a quality open source compliance program. Now, open chain might be a short industry standard, but it is a comprehensive one. Everything that we have included in the open chain standard is based on real world experience from user companies out there. Now, if you think about it, we have around 25 years of experience around open source. Some of this experience is based on deploying products. Some of this experience is based on working with projects. One thing that has been consistent is that in using open source licenses, everyone has been trying to optimize their work. They've been trying to do their best to meet different requirements and to do so in a timely manner. However, Trying to do it on your own, company by company, is inherently inefficient, especially when you consider the global supply chain. The supply chain is made up of incredible amounts of companies. One product might go through 20 to 40 companies before hitting market. Chip makers, board makers, people who make additional components, the people who provide drivers. It's a long supply chain. If everyone is doing their own thing with open source license compliance, well, first of all, it's hard to predict what your suppliers and your customers are doing and what they need. It's also hard to predict what processes are in the right place and solid enough for your use cases. The result is that in the past, we have seen license compliance challenges on an individual company level, perhaps it's about maturity. On a supply chain level, it's really about consistency. Open chain, well, it identifies the inflection points where it's important to have a process in place. It helps to contextualize how you deal with inbound, internal, and outbound open source code, whether you're deploying it in a product or a solution. We brought together hundreds of companies in drafting and initially deploying this standard. It has been remarkably successful as a de facto industry standard since October 2016. We've seen a global community come to life and set up work groups in areas like automotive and tooling. Equally important, perhaps more important, we have seen very active local communities form in China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, India, Germany, and the UK. Companies, user companies, came together to try to ensure that not only were the important process points identified, but where appropriate, knowledge was shared and recorded. One good example is that we have reference training slides. You don't have to use these training slides to have a quality open source compliance program. You don't have to use them to be open chain conformant. But open chain does require training. And if you need some inspiration, these reference training slides built from material provided by companies such as Arm, Qualcomm, Samsung, and Royal Philips Electronics, it's available. And in the open chain project, our standard, of course, is not editable. 
we edit it through a formal process with a work group and votes on the steering committee. But our reference material to help inspire you on training, policies, checklists, all of that is CC0. It's effectively public domain. Because we have had a very active community and because we've seen a lot of growth since October 2016, we had the feedback that we needed to make OpenChain better. In some places, we adjusted language to make it easier to translate or to read if you're a non-native English speaker. In some places, we refined a few of the terms to help ensure that companies which are not in the software field, which are very different to the companies we're used to seeing around Linux Foundation, well, that they could use the standard too. From tobacco companies to medical companies, from banks to defense, we've had all types of engagement and taken all kinds of feedback. By April 2019, we had the second generation of our standard. It wasn't hugely different from the first, but it was refined. And this version of the standard we knew could work across all industry areas and for companies of any size, especially in the context of working in areas where English is not a first language. We built on this standard with additional reference material. There's over a thousand documents in our GitHub repository, our, we call it, reference library. By April 2020, we were fully confident that OpenChain as a standard was done. It was ready for wider deployment to scale from hundreds of companies to thousands of companies. And the best way to do this was to enter a formal standardization process. So we did. Joint Development Foundation, a foundation that has existed for a while, is focused on helping specification projects like OpenChain enter standardization processes such as ISO. Indeed, it has been part of the Linux Foundation ecosystem for about a year now. And it has become a past submitter, a fast track submitter to ISO since early this year. The great thing of working with Joint Development Foundation was that OpenChain as a project didn't have special domain knowledge about ISO editing, but JDF could connect us with the people that do. We got a pass editor to help us reformat where necessary, and we got help with the process of taking OpenChain till in market since 2020, uh, sorry, 2019, taking that in 2020 into the ISO process and graduating it as not just an industry standard, but a formal ISO international standard. We submitted in April. April 2020, we went into what's called, and this is a wordy bit, ISO IEC JTC1 pass transposition process. Put simply, when there's a standard that pre-exists, it's already deployed, it already works, you don't have to go through a 50 or 60 month edit and publication cycle. You just go through around nine months of review, acceptance vote, and publication. We went through the acceptance vote, finished end of September, and now we're currently, as of recording this on the 25th of November, we're currently just waiting to hit the go from ISO. We're PRF 5230, which means uh, proof of international standard. And in a few days, we expect ISO to release us under IS and then a number international standard. Long story short, OpenChain in the course of around five years became a popular standard the first and the only standard to deal with open source license compliance. After four years and a little bit of refinement, it was clear this standard was ready to scale to thousands of companies. In other words, put simply, to help every company in the world dealing with open source to have the key requirements of a quality open source compliance program. To do this, we went into ISO. We did that in partnership with Joint Development Foundation, and we're done. We passed the process on the approval vote. We had great support from JTC1, Joint Technical Committee 1, and we're the first Linux Foundation ISO standard in 14 years. The last time we did this, we did it directly. We did it with a Linux standard base. Now, working with Joint Development Foundation, we've created a process. OpenChain was us, as you could say, dogfooding it. It was our first time through this process. We had some learning to do. 
but we've learned it, we've codified it, we've recorded it, and Joint Development Foundation is ready to take other specifications in our ecosystem and bring them into ISO to graduate as formal international standards. As Jim mentioned a little while ago at another event, the next standard coming through JDF and out of ISO is SPDX. SPDX 2.2 has been submitted and will graduate somewhere end of Q1, middle of Q2 2021. That's news to watch for, but in the short term, you should come away from this talk aware that open source license compliance has an ISO international standard that you can access information about this standard at www.openchainproject.org, that you can self-certify to this standard on openchainproject.org for free, that there's over a thousand reference documents to help you with your processes, your policy, your training at openchainproject.org. And there's a vibrant community, whether you want to be on a global mailing list or a local work team, whether you want to work in English or German or Japanese or Chinese, we've got you covered. Alrighty, it's time to be part of this. It's time to adopt this standard. Get it into sales and procurement. Talk with your suppliers. Make it part of your purchasing. Make it part of your pitch as why your company has a great way of managing open source and can be trusted to do so effectively. Remember, this standard is all about user companies solving user company problems. It makes sure open source is efficient, it makes sure it's easy, and it makes sure that your resources allocated are minimum while results are maximized. Thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward, if you're not already part of this, to welcoming you on board. Thank you, Shane. Our final keynote speaker today is Yong Sub Lee, Chief Technology Officer at, and co-founder of Sci5. Sci5 is the uh, first fabulous semiconductor company to build the uh, customized uh, silicon, customized silicon based on the uh, free and open RISC-V instruction set architecture. Yonsap received his PhD from UC Berkeley, where uh, he co-designed the RISC-V ISA and the first RISC-V semicon uh, microprocessors with uh, Andrew Waterman, and led the uh, development of the Watcher decoupled vector fetch extension. Today, Yonsap will talk about the technical opportunity of RISC-V Please welcome Yonsap Lee. Hello everybody, my name is Yonsap Lee. I am Chief Technology Officer at Sci5. It's great to meet you all today. I am very excited to talk to you about RISC-5 and to convince you that the time is now for you to help out RISC-5. It's truly transformative times where the compute requirements are exceeding Moore's Law. Look at this graph over here. The CPU performance basically has plateaued since 2015, while we continue to imagine new applications that need more compute requirements than we can even afford. AI is expanding from data center to the edge. Growth in embedded endpoints are tremendous. All these trends are forcing us to shift away from general purpose compute platforms. Companies are vertically integrating, trying to build highly optimized products, design domain specific architectures to build workload focused platforms. What this means to me is that we have all the ingredients for a big disruption in our industry here. This brings us to this inflection point where RISC V, the free and open instruction set architecture, is gaining momentum and adoption. RISC V is a modern clean slate design that delivers scalability and superior performance, power, and area efficiency compared to competing technology. RISC V is engineered for practical use cases across microcontrollers, application processors, and high performance computing platforms. But all in all, it is the RISC-V's openness and lack of proprietary lock-in that encourages long-term adoption, that is attracting a large community of contributors to RISC-V. 
So practically what this means for companies that are thinking about using RISC-V or actually using RISC-V is that RISC-V reduces the cost of software through community leverage and broad reuse. So since the start of the RISC-V Foundation since 2015, we have gathered more than 750 foundation members across 50 countries. The 750 members are split across 300 companies and institutions and 450 individual members. 2020 is the 10th anniversary of RISC-V and in the past 10 years, RISC-V has been used in many applications and vertical markets. At Sci-5, we have more than 200 design wins with 80 companies, including six of the top 10 tech companies. I'd like to mention a couple of these applications and vertical markets so that you can get a sense of where our technology is being used. FPGA hardened cores, augmented reality, audio processing, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, data plane processing, industrial robotics, human interface design, networking, edge AI controllers, voice recognition, smart cities, fast storage, internet of things, satellites, you name it, RISC-V probably is used in your favorite application or vertical market. It is our technology that enabled RISC-V to get into these applications and vertical markets, but most of all, the most important part was the RISC-V ecosystem that, that enabled all these use cases. So let me walk through the current state of the RISC-V ecosystem, starting from embedded. We have great support of RISC-V in various real-time operating systems and trace and debug IDE tools, both in open source and commercial. To name a couple of open source projects that have RISC-V support that comes to my mind are RISC-Free, RTOS, RTEMS, RIA, and Zephyr. On the commercial side, Sci5 has been working with partners such as IR Systems, Seger, Lauterbach, Wind River, Green Hills to design RISC-V solutions and delivering them to our partners together. Switching on to the Linux and application RISC-V ecosystem side of things, starting from bootloaders, we have Coreboot, Uboot, UEFI, Tiana Core, which is an open source implementation of the UEFI, have RISC-V support. On the distro side, we have Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, Gentoo, SUSE, OpenWRT, FreeBSD, NetBSD uh, with RISC-V support. Let's take a closer look at Debian. Debian builds 95% of packages on RISC-V. This is an important milestone in becoming a normal architecture. Last year at the RISC-V Summit, Carlos had shown Docker and Kubernetes on Debian RISC-V, working on Hi5 Unleashed Development Board from Sci5. Looking into Fedora, in 2018, Western Digital has done a Fedora desktop tutorial. The most recent news in 2020 is that the EFI boot works on Hi5 Unleashed and QEMU. Look at this picture over here. This is the genome desktop manager working on Fedora RISC-V on top of the Hi5 Unleashed development board. At Sci5, we have taken RISC-V ecosystem development very seriously from day one, and that's one of the main reasons why we started the Hi5 development program. Starting from embedded development, we have launched Hi5 One development board in 2016, and subsequently the Hi5 One Rev B with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth support. On the application and Linux development side, we have launched Hi5 Unleashed development board back in 2018, and we have worked with partners like Microchip to develop the Hi5 Unleashed expansion kit with. Polifier FPGA to provide IOs and capabilities to extend the Hi5 Unleashed development board to design your own domain specific computers. All in all, these Hi5 development boards had enabled the first wave of RISC-V ecosystem development. Switching to the RISC-V software, uh, state of things. We have pretty much all the important open source software projects having RISC-V support all upstream to their respective projects. Just to name a couple of 
few projects that have RISC V support are GCC, LLVM, GDB, Binutils, Newlib, GLibc, Linux Kernel, and QMU all have RISC V support in their respective upstream open source repositories. At SciFi, we have a couple of software products as well. These are the four pillars of our software products, starting from Freedom Studio, which is our Eclipse CNC++ development environment, which integrates the RISC-V cross-compiler, OpenOCD debugger, Segger JLink debugger, QMU emulator with the Freedom ESTK software package. Freedom Tools is Sci-Fi's RISC-V development tools package, which integrates all these subcomponents and is released on a normal cadence. Freedom ESDK is our bare metal software development kit. Freedom USDK is our Linux software development kit based on Yocto and Open Embedded. I have prepared a short video to show you the state of the current RISC-V software ecosystem. So let's take a look. Freedom Studio is Sci-Fi's free all-in-one software development IDE. Freedom Studio bundles all the tools necessary to get started developing software on RISC-V, whether you are using Hi5 series boards or an FPGA board with an IP package downloaded from Sci-Fi Core Designer. Freedom Studio provides access to all the advanced debugging features in Sci-Fi cores, including trace, peripheral viewers, advanced hardware triggers, and performance counters. With Freedom Studio, you'll be creating, building, and debugging RISC-V software in minutes. using the, uh, the JLink GDB server to communicate with the JLink on this board, click debug, and essentially the JLink GDB server will connect to the target and download the, the project or the code. So if you're looking for a sequence diagram like feature, uh, we have something, a chart that's built in that will show you the flow as it goes from, for example, function 10 here, um, back up to in essence main, and then back down to function 11. What I have here is the IR Embedded Workbench for RISC-V. When you start Embedded Workbench, uh, you have this uh, information center with uh, some additional information, product explorer, user guides, example projects. We mainly have support for all cores here from Sci-5. If you look under the view menu, you will have all the capabilities. You have information about uh, the call stack, uh, breakpoints that you are using. We of course support uh, data breakpoints. You can look into the memory, you have all the registers, everything very easy and uh, easy to use. Hope you enjoyed the video. RISC-V has made tremendous progress in the past five years, and I personally wanted to say thank you for your contribution. Okay, let's switch gears and talk a bit about the future of RISC-V. Personally, I think the name of the game is to capture the core of the next generation leading compute platforms in intelligent edge, storage, mobile, high-performance computing, networking, 
embedded automotive and 5G base station. The key to success here is having the RISC-V software ecosystem and the RISC-V ecosystem for these applications and vertical markets ready to go. To that extent, at Sci5, we have launched the Hi5 Amash Development Board, the next generation RISC-V development board last October. This Hi5 Amash Development Board has the Sci5's FU740 processor here, integrates eight gigabytes of DDR4 memory with four of the USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, gigabit ethernet, micro USB, a micro SD card slot here, and a by 16 PCIe expansion slot backed by PCI Gen 3 by eight lanes, and an NVMe M.2 slot, and an M.2e key for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth expansion capabilities. This all comes in a mini ITX PC form factor with an ATX24 pin power supply connector. Hi5 and MASH development board is a result of hearing your feedback. So what we've heard from you is you love the Linux capable RISC-V development platform, but would like a bit more advanced features such as more processing capabilities, high speed IOs with expansion capabilities, pretty much coming in an industry standard form factor and out of the box software has to work. This is a result of the Hi5 of Mesh board here. And now let's take a look at the FU740 SoC in more detail. This SoC integrates four of the U74 application processors with an S7 embedded processor. The Severin series CPU is our 64-bit eight-stage dual issue superscalar RISC-5 cores. All these five cores are coherently backed by a two megabyte L2 cache, which is backed by a DDR4 memory controller. The SoC integrates a PCIe Gen 3 by 8 controller with a gigabit Ethernet controller and a bunch of peripherals. Now let's take a look at the Hi5 Mesh development board in action. That was pretty cool. Just a quick recap on Hi5 Unmatched. The board will be available in a couple weeks. You can put your order online at Crowd Supplier or Mouser. For more information, just go online and search for Hi5 Unmatched or visit sci5.com forward slash boards. 
As I mentioned before, RISC V software has made tremendous progress over the past couple of years, but we could definitely use your help. To be more concrete, the RISC V porting work has begun on UEFI, V8, Java, and Android. But obviously, these projects could go much faster if you're willing to jump in and help out. In conclusion, let's go build the RISC V ecosystem together for a better future. These look like big mountains to climb, but let's not forget it's about this virtual cycle here. Start from RISC V, a free and open architecture, add your commercial innovation here, and with community contribution, we'll end up with a much stronger base for a better future. I'm counting on your support. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you all for joining us here at Open Source Summit Japan and Automotive Linux Summit. And another big thanks to our sponsors. We hope you had enjoyed keynotes and encourage uh, you to uh, join our uh, breakout sessions beginning at 10.25 a.m. in Japan time. We very much hope to see you in person next year and uh, enjoy the reminder of the conference. And have a wonderful day. Thank you so much and see you next year.